Fantastic. Well, let's get rolling, Paul. What do you say? Sounds good. Okay. So we've talked about the logistics, joining the Slack channel, and uh, let's just let's just dive right in with some introductions. Uh, so, Paul, why don't you start? How has your career progressed, and how did you decide to found Octopus Deploy? That's a great question. <laughs> um, so I guess I was a, a consultant. Octopus. I started Octopus like eight years ago now. So it's been uh, it's been going for a while. Um, prior to Octopus, so I worked as a consultant, and um, this is back before DevOps was much of a thing. Like uh, no one really talked about DevOps. So deployment and and DevOps, what we call DevOps now, was kind of like incidental to your job. In the same way, like doing timesheets is incidental. Like you don't. It's not like you you write a job description for software engineers and you know like you know, job number four is to do timesheets, but you kind of just have to do it. And deployment was the same. And at the time, um, I had this pyramid, like, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs of all the things you, that you kind of need for life. And yeah. for software engineering, it was kind of the same. You have like source control. Like if you don't have source control, you don't really have anything. And then above that, you have uh, a build server and, and the ability to create builds that don't just work on your machine. And then after that, you need some way of deploying it. And there were great solutions for the first two. We had, um, you know, Git was fairly new, uh, but subversion source safe going back TFS um, for for source control and there were build servers like Team City. So you could come onto a new project as a consultant and set those things up within a day. And then deployment was kind of this thing that you just you started to just cart around like a, a boatload of PowerShell scripts uh, from project to project. And then um, and so Octopus was kind of built as a solution to that really. Awesome. Okay, a question for you, Jeffrey. Um, <laughs> what does Clear Measure do, and, and why have you made servicing Octopus uh, a focus of what you do there? Sure, sure. So, um, Clear Measure is all about uh, enabling um, enabling people to to achieve more with custom software, and specifically Visual Studio based software. Um, and so, we we focus on Microsoft custom um, custom software systems of all types. And going back to uh, 2005 and automating software with cruisecontrol.net and a whole bunch of shell scripting, um, there's been just a progression where um, the, the folks at Clear Measure going back uh, a, a long time and, and just everyone's just individual path has been all about quality and speed and, and automating the whole process from changing some code or writing some code to getting it working on environments, um, especially production environments, has been key to that to that speed. Now it's interesting that um, when you do things based on off of a Word document and deploying off of a Word document, invariably you will not squeeze out all the variability of that and and things go wrong in deployments and then you have stressful software rollouts. And the only way to solve that is by automating it because the computer will do it the same time, the same, the same every time. And so even going back, you know, 13 years when the solutions essentially were cruisecontrol.net was the was just a general purpose build server that we jerry-rigged to also do or kick off deployment scripting. And it was all shell scripted custom by hand. Um, but the key was automate the overall process. And once the process is automated, then it's the same every time. And then and it's uh, progressively augmented. And what we're talking about here is quality control. We're putting in quality control steps to squeeze out variability, squeeze out defects, problems, issues, before we actually do that final deployment to production for a given release. And so, you know, fast forward to the various uh, technologies. When the Octopus Deploy came around, it was a sh just a tectonic shift in the industry about making this automatic. So no longer was it one-off bespoke custom script for deploying, but now these libraries of, of tasks that are available right out of the box where you just really do you know, click, click, click. And in our case, we have just so many templates built up for so many different common application types. Now we come in and do a deployment just like that with snap of the fingers and it's automatic every time. And uh, we have a high quality repeatable pipeline where um, it just catches so many defects. And it's interesting, everybody wants to go fast. Everybody wants to be productive. Everybody wants to get stuff done. But if you go for speed first, then you end up with quality issues and things that get missed. And then you end up going really slow because half of your time is spent just fixing problems. And depending on who you're reading and what stats you're coming out of, a lot of people estimate half of the time of a developer is spent on fixing bugs, fixing problems. When you have an automated continuous delivery pipeline, um, 
and the modern instance, not 13 years ago, but the modern instance is Octopus Deploy doing the deployments, then you squeeze out all the quality issues and the, the percentage of your time spent fixing problems dramast, dramatically goes down. And so you end up spending a greater percentage of your time working on the software features and then you gain the speed. So you focus on quality first and speed automatically follows. But if you try to go for speed first, then you miss quality, which saps your speed and you get neither. So this, this complete automation is a focus on quality control. So QA departments everywhere, if your company has them, should be rejoicing for joy um, because you go for quality, you achieve it, and then speed automatically comes right behind it. And so that's what we focus on. And Octopus Deploy is just the premier software tool for, for this space. And uh, it, it hasn't gone wrong even with a single client engagement. And so it's our, it's our tool of choice for, for uh, deploying even simple and complex uh, software systems. All right, next question. Okay, so Jeff, so, so a question came in. When a deployment fails, how do you configure a rollback? Sure, um, so this, there's, some, there's some principles that come into play um, when we're deploying forward and then when something goes wrong. Now, there is a feature in Octopus Deploy called uh, guided failure mode, and that is essentially dropping back to manual approval or uh, a manual retry. And that is not intended for an automated rollback. It's intended for a human to get involved. And so um, a rollback is a deployment failure. That's, it's just as simple as that. It's a deployment failure. Nothing in continuous delivery is designed to go backwards. Um, but let's discuss some, co some common scenarios. If your deployment project is completely item potent, maybe it's a system of interaction rather than a system of record, then you can redeploy the previous release to that environment no problem. If it's a website that doesn't have any state or if it's a Windows service that processes things off of a queue and it's architected so that there's no shared state, you can redeploy the previous release and go back and forth and that's no problem. Um, but if your deployment does rely on state, it's maybe it's a system of record or otherwise has a database or uh, a file system that's gonna be mutated, then you have to include support for deploying backward into your architecture. There's no such thing in continuous delivery as an automatic rollback. Because think about it from a, from, from a trust perspective, you have some infrastructure that just failed to do what you wanted it to do in deploying the next release. Are you then actually going to trust it to then properly do the right thing in attempting to automatically go backwards? So it's just not a scenario that exists in the continuous delivery space, which is designed to constantly go forward. But you can design this into the architecture of your system. Let me give you an example. You got a database, everybody has a database. You're splitting a phone number field um, on a database table. And so you, you do a data, a data task, you split the data, and now you throw away the original column. Well, you have destroyed data. The only way to go backwards in, in that is to essentially restore that SQL Server database from a, a backup, which is not an automated task in most of our cases. It just takes too long. Um, and, so, and so you'd have to rely on, on backup. But you can create compatibility shims in your shared state um, that makes your database compatible with multiple versions. And then you can redeploy an old version upon failure. Let me give you an example. Step one, modify your SQL Server database with the new and the old schema compatibility so that both versions of your application can work on that version of the schema. Then you deploy and you still have the same application components but the new database schema that's compatible. Then you modify your application then you do another deploy. Um, then you modify the database after it's stable to remove the old schema elements and then you deploy again. And so you have a multiple release um, progression to move through, but that preserves your ability to redeploy the previously stable uh, release on any of the environments because you have thought about the ability to go backwards even though you're managing a mutating state along the way. So you have to think about these scenarios and design it in. Um, and and uh, that's, uh, that's just uh, kind of the way it goes and, and, and you have to apply some architecture. Yeah, I want to I want to echo that. We we get asked this all the time, and I think by definition, if your deployment failed, it's probably because you didn't predict what caused it to fail. Because if you did, you would have 
written something to work around it in the first place, right? And so the idea of a tool getting involved and trying to kind of automatically fix this when production's down on something you couldn't predict and the tool probably couldn't predict, this seems kind of dangerous. Yeah, but it's a common question because uh, when we're doing it manually, we think, oh, let's roll back because we as humans with our intelligent brain are essentially designing a rollback you know, on the fly, but that's, that's manual. If we want it completely automated, we have to tell the computer exactly what to do because the computer is not going to guess like, like an intelligent humans can. All right, so back to you, Paul. Um, here's another uh, question from our attendees. It's challenging for me to create my Octopus projects to optimize reusability. Any tips for creating more reusable projects that I can use as templates for other projects? Yeah, this comes through our support channels a lot too. So, so there are different reasons why people need to make things reusable. Um, and sometimes, so sometimes, being able to copy and clone things isn't necessarily the way to go. Um, if you go to the next slide, I put a diagram into or a picture to help explain this one. So, so one one reason people end up copying things and creating templates in Octopus is because they 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 have a scenario where they need to deploy the same thing multiple times. So an example might be they need to deploy the app for each of their customers, or they have different brands that they trade under. So they've kind of got a project that's you know nearly like 90% the same and then like there's a 10% that's different. So there's a feature in Octopus that I don't think gets used enough called multi-tenancy and you can see it being used in this screenshot here. We've got a project here called the Phoenix project. So every company has a, a Phoenix project. There's um, environments that it's getting deployed to, but it's getting deployed on behalf of these tenants. Uh, and there's a question about multi-tenancy later. So we'll talk about this a little bit more, but through doing something like this, you can kind of avoid needing to create templates so multi-tenancy kind of adds a different way to do it um, but sometimes there are times you need to to just make things reusable if you go to the next i don't know if i can, can i go to the next slide you might have to there you go um, yeah so so there's a thing called step templates um, this is really useful when you're trying to create some kind of standardized process for deployment especially if you've got a lot of projects you're pushing through octopus so you can take any of the built-in steps or any custom steps um, and you can create them as templates and you give them parameters that people can fill in. Um, they get versioned, snapshotted, all of that sort of good stuff. Uh, and then you can use those as the building blocks for your projects. So if you think in object oriented programming terms, this is sort of the composition approach to, to reuse um, as opposed to just cloning and, and copying and pasting. And there's also other features like library variable sets and so on. One thing that I, kind of encourage you to think about if you just go to the next one. Um, so, so it's good to think about how things are going to change over time. So if you've got things that tend to, uh, to converge over time, so let's say that you're, you're trying to create like a standardized approach that all of your engineering team are going to use, but right now no, no one's really using it, but you kind of, you're trying to push them there. Um, over time, things are going to become more similar. And so creating ways of reusing things through step templates, library variable sets, uh, all that sort of thing, that's, that's, a, that's a good way to go about it. But if you're trying to reuse things because, and they tend to diverge over time. So an example of that would be you're a web agency and every customer that you sign on, you're creating a website and they all start out similar, but then six months on each one kind of becomes more complicated. You know, they start to add different services. If you were to look at that over time, you'd say they, they tend to become more different over time. And if you're doing that, then actually copying and pasting is a pretty good way to go. So in projects in Octopus, you can clone them. Uh, a few other things you can clone. Uh, you can use the API to, to make copies of things pretty easily. Um, those, those are times when it's, it's fine to do that and I would encourage you to do that because you can tie yourself in knots trying to create step templates for things, but then add parameters because for some projects they need to do this and some projects need to do that. Um, sometimes copying and pasting can be a, a better way to go. Awesome. Okay. So Jeffrey, what technical advantages do you see with Octopus and when is it the best choice? Now, clearly the answer to this is it's always the best choice. But admittedly, I'm probably a bit biased. What's your take on this? So um, there are some scenarios when it is definitely not the best choice. 
And those are scenarios where you are deploying to a machine that is not connected to the network. Um, Octopus Deploy does require that tentacle communication, you know, back and forth. So if you have those scenarios, you know, out in an oil field or whatnot, um, then you just don't have a means to set up the network in order to get that connected. So Octopus Deploy is a connected solution. But, um, but back to the technical advantages, uh, Octopus Deploy has the most built-in support for Visual Studio applications of any product on the market. And specifically, I, I know that I am I am speaking to you know a a uh for the microsoft scenario octopus deploy has lots of support for non-microsoft as well but in our world um we're a microsoft focused software engineering firm and it has uh, hands down the most support for for all types of visual studio applications of any product on the market and and currently expanding uh, i just do want to talk about a uh, competitor we'll talk about more later vsts has good support for web applications to azure um, um, and, but probably no inherent advantage in that scenario when you put Octopus to pull against VSTS. However, if there are virtual machines in your environment, hands down, you need Octopus deploy. Um, if you're, if you're deploying anything to a virtual machine, um, you're going to do a whole lot of scripting with any other product that we've looked at, whereas Octopus Deploy makes so many scenarios completely automatic. Um, now, Octopus Deploy, and we'll talk about this later. There's a later question. Octopus Deploy is not a build server. We'll talk about, uh, there's, a, there's a later question that dives more into that. Um, it does not broker between source and release. It does expect a deployable release candidate to be packaged and ready to go, um, uh, as opposed to build servers, which kind of navigate that. Um, and, and we do have a best of breed implementation to share a little bit later on. Um, but Octopus Deploy does not run and record results of your test suites. So um, that's, that's why there's build servers on the market. Um, also, um, technical advantages when managing VMs, uh, if, if you've been paying attention to the products, VSTS probably, um, you've looked at that and it has added deployment groups. Um, it's early. Um, but hands down, Octopus deploys support for um, all kinds of deployments on virtual machines is unmatched anywhere. Um, any other product you try to use, you're going to be doing a lot of PowerShell scripting. That's, that's just kind of the reality at the moment. Anything to add, Paul? No, that's, that sounds good to me. All right. Um, all right, so Paul, another question uh, sent in. Uh, my project dashboard is like a checkerboard. Where did I go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> so this is the fun thing of being a software vendor. So when you're designing the product, right, you kind of, so in our, in our minds, there's this wonder, wonderful world where every company has four environments, you know, dev, test, staging, and prod or something. And they all have like 10 projects and they all have like a dozen machines and that's it. And it's hard to shake that, that from your imagination. But when we do support calls with customers or when we go and see them and, and see how they're using Octopus, we realize actually that's not, uh, that's not what the world looks like. Um, so if you go to the next slide, there's a, a picture of, to kind of illustrate what, what this, what this problem looks like. So this, this is the checkerboard pattern, right? Where we've got, um, in this case, a, a project, we've got a bunch of tenants that it's being deployed to, but sometimes this can be the main dashboard where you have a bunch of different projects and we have a bunch of environments, but there's a, the deployments are really sparse across this. And they're like, so no one's ever deployed um, Jupiter to Neptune dev. Um, so there's a, a few different um, parts to, uh, to ways you can model things within Octopus. And this checkerboard thing typically manifests because one of those parts isn't being used quite right. Um, I don't know if you can uh, let me sh click the screen at all. Because uh, I, I did an animation, there we go. I, f I forgot I wouldn't be driving. Here we go. Um, so we've got uh, so one of so we've got like these different dimensions, and I tried to do like a four-dimensional drawing in in Google Slides, but it didn't work very well. Um, so one of the dimensions is uh, is projects. Um, the next one is environments. So so these are two different ways in which you model things, right? And these are pretty obvious. The projects are the things you're deploying. The environments are the places you're deploying to. Next, you've got uh, tenants. So tenants kind of makes this three-dimensional in some ways. So you've got, you're deploying a project to production, 
for every one of your end customers. Um, and there's other different ways of using tenants, which we'll talk about later. But so that essentially gives you three different axes on which you can break down the way you're doing deployments. Um, and then of course the fourth dimension is sort of time where we've got uh, the releases and deployments that are, that are being continuously created from these things. So if you've got that checkerboard dashboard thing, oh, and, and this, this is a plug for a new feature we're working on. This is spaces where we kind of uh, create these galaxies of, of, uh, of these things. Um, so if you've got this checkerboard thing going on, it might be because you could be using tenants um, but, but you're currently not. So in the example we had on the previously, there were lots of different environments because the customer wanted to create a different environment for each of their tenants. Um, whereas they could have just been tagging, uh, tagging things appropriately and then just have a single environment called dev and a single environment called production. Um, these things vary. And there are, there are some reasons we have seen where people do need to do this as a general rule. So, so having lots of projects in Octopus isn't a problem. Having lots of tenants in Octopus isn't a problem. And here I'm, by lots, I'm talking about hundreds or thousands. Um, having lots of environments is typically a sign that you could be doing things differently. So if you're kind of getting up to like 30 environments and you're having to scroll horizontally a lot, um, there might be a different way you could be modeling things. And this is where talking to you guys at clear measure or contacting our support and just kind of running through what you're trying to do. We might be able to suggest some alternative ways to model things. Yeah, we've seen, uh, we've seen this symptom uh, time and time again, where we say, okay, Hey, show me, show me your octopus deploy uh, implementation. And they show a checkerboard and we say, okay, well, what's the flow. And well, it, when you have this checkerboard, now a human needs to actually click on deploy buttons manually and say, oh, I'm deploying from this, this release, from this environment to that environment. Well, now you've completely lost all the automatic um, capabilities of continuous delivery. And now you just have push button deployments, but you still have to have a human who understands everything to know which deploy button to press. And so you've lost a lot of the capabilities where if if you decide what's the progression of environments, and yeah, even if you have seven or 10 environments, um, to get to production, well, they line them up in a sequence and maybe you have some parallel environments, but the uh, lack of recognition when maybe you have three equal QA environments or maybe you have two equal staging environments, one for environment validation and another for a performance or load testing suite that you run right before production, but they are still a staging environment. They are just parallel and they are equal. So they are the same environment staging, but you can use tenants to have two of them and then you can deploy and continue progressing to the right instead of skipping stages and then it becomes confusing and you actually have to have a team member understand the progression rather than baking in the progression logic in your life cycle directly. All right, let's get back. So Jeffrey, uh, perhaps I'm already using a build server. How should I choose between VSTS and Octopus? Uh, and what should the whole infrastructure look like? Sure. Uh, so as you said before, um, Octopus Deploy is not a build server, it's a deployment server. Um, and so if implementing a completely automated continuous delivery pipeline, uh, you must deploy to an environment and then run tests, um, at least in your first environment and hopefully in all of your environments. Um, a continuous delivery pipeline, again, this is all about quality control. We are doing this to squeeze out all possible variability in our journey to deliver a particular release candidate to production so that it's stable, it's predictable, and there are no stress deployments all the way through to production. And so we want to model a continuous delivery pipeline where it's, it's rinse and repeat. We deploy to an environment and then we validate something we check something. And so it's two steps. We need to deploy and then we need to have another process that does some type of test suite, automatic validation, some type of automatic check. And we'll just call these test suites, whatever they happen to do. It's a test suite. It could be one thing to check or it could be a thousand different tests within this test suite, but every environment in a continuous delivery pipeline needs some sort of test suite. Even if it's, even if it's merely, um, at the end, deploying to production and then running a single 
PowerShell invoke web request just to make sure that something is online. That is still a test, okay? So um, we need uh, the build server working in conjunction with the Octopus deploy servers. Um, and we also will have three distinct types of environments. Let me, let me fast forward on to um, a model here um, where we, we implement this all the time. Um, we have three distinct types of environments in a continuous delivery pipeline. Everybody knows production, okay? That's one of them. Um, also, everybody knows the next one, which is the manual test environment. Whether you call it test or call it QA or call it staging or call it UAT or have all of the above, it's you deploy it somewhere so humans can do a particular check of some type. It's manual testing, that's a type. The third type of environment, which is new to most people starting out to do uh, continuous delivery, is the automated test environment. It is the no humans allowed test environment where the application is deployed and then the test automation automatically kicks in and runs the test suite, does the checks, and then when it's done, the next release candidate that's coming down the line automatically gets deployed, the original one gets blown away. So if you tried to log into that environment, then the application will be stripped out from under you anyway. It's a no humans allowed environment, completely automated. So those are the three distinct types of environments in a continuous delivery pipeline. Automated, completely automated, manual test, and then production. And you could have as many automated environments as you want, as many manual environments as you want, um, but, but there are three types. Um, now this diagram that you're seeing on the screen uh, now, if I, if I go forward, this diagram you're seeing on the screen is part of a larger uh, implementation poster. By the way, if anybody is interested in receiving the full uh, laminated continuous delivery poster for your office, let us know. Uh, we'd be happy to, uh, to, to mail or FedEx you one. Um, this is just a screenshot of a portion of it. And this is the overall orchestration of, of uh, an environment that has VSTS working in conjunction with Octopus Deploy. And so VSTS is used as a build server and in conjunction with uh, Git source control. And so um, you can't see the text, and we don't have time to go into all the steps, but um, VSTS runs the build, the continuous integration build, and sticks into NuGet uh, package management, the NuGet packages for the particular application, and then kicks off a VSTS release in release manager because VSTS has the ability to run test suites, but Octopus Deploy is uh, the, the, the tool that does the deployment. So um, using the Visual Studio Marketplace um, extension for Octopus Deploy, we have VSTS for each environment delegate to Octopus Deploy to do the application deployment. And then it notifies VSTS back when it's finished, when the application's fully deployed, so that VSTS can run the appropriate test suite and then record the results and say, okay, whether it passed or failed, all right? By the way, I see some of the people in the chat. Um, if you'd like a, a poster of this overall, yeah, just make sure to um, either um, put uh, some good, some good uh, contact information in the Zoom chat or otherwise just follow up um, in the link afterwards and we'll make sure you get a poster. So don't, don't let us off the hook, okay? Um, but this is how you put them together. Now let me zoom in a little bit um, into just this piece. Again, we have the first line test automation environment, the second line manual environment, and then production. Each of these are the same as in, hey, Octopus Deploy, please do all of the heavy lifting to deploy my application, no matter how simple or how complex it is. When you're done, then tell me, so then I'll come back and I'll run the appropriate test suite and record all those tests, um, and then we have the complete flow. This is a VSTS screenshot of uh, a VSTS implementation. You can see that the task in VSTS is, hey, Octopus, do a whole lot of work to, this is the first environment, to create the Octopus Deploy release and deploy to that first environment. This is where it's really important that Octopus Deploy is configured with the proper life cycle so that, so that you don't have to log in to Octopus Deploy and manually press a deploy button. We want everything completely automated. And so then VSCS will download the NuGet package that contains the appropriate test suite for this particular environment, maybe do a little variable poking, and then run acceptance tests. Um, and then, of course, publish the test results, and, and it, it's, uh, it's the full loop, okay? Um, so that's how they work in conjunction. Remember, 
deploying the application, Octopus Deploy makes that a breeze. But the one piece to really close the loop is a capability to run test suites. And so whether it's VSTS or Jenkins or Team City, um, you need to come back and, and run your test suites on the environment, on that pre-production environment after the deployment's uh, been completed. Anything to add there, Paul? I think that's, that's great. Yeah, I think, so we do see customers trying to run integration tests through Octopus. It's not really the best place. Um, being able to deploy to the test environment with Octopus is great, especially if you're trying to do like load testing, because you can have an environment that actually, you know, mimics the production workload and Octopus can deploy to all these machines. Um, but build servers, by and large, are going to give you a much better experience around viewing those test results, looking at the test failures, looking at how test failures have increased or decreased over time. Um, that's what they're built for. You know, that's a good point. Uh, one other thing, a lot of times in, in our client implementations, we find that there's often a need to place a tentacle connected VM in the same network subnet as the target environment. And when we have the test suite bundled up in a NuGet package and, 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 and deployed via a tentacle into a machine uh, uh, that's maybe, maybe it's a jump box or just a dedicated machine for testing purposes in the same network subnet, then we have access to the full environment and, um, and that way the test suite can be actually deployed to and most of the time deployment is just exploding that NuGet package, getting the files on disk and whether it's X unit or N unit, um, essentially running that command line or using, the, using a built-in uh, helper step to execute that test suite poke you know app settings to connect it to the right uh to, to the right application instance um and so deploying the test suite can actually be done with octopus as well and that's um a really good advantage all right paul next question uh, from our from our uh, viewers what might push me to move to the new octopus deploy cloud which i heard was a thing lately yeah, yeah. If, if, uh, for anyone who missed the announcement, so uh, so we have an Octopus Cloud offering. So this is the first step is really just um, taking Octopus as it is, the exact same product that we make downloadable through the website, um, but we're hosting that in virtual machines for you. And the nice thing about them being in virtual machines is obviously they're they're isolated uh, and all that goodness. Um, depending on you know how quickly it takes off, we may change some of that architecture and try and make it kind of more cloud modern, um, but, but that's a pretty good starting point. The main reason for making it is we had a lot of people starting to come to us and say, look, Octopus is the only VM I have left. You know, everything else I'm doing is PaaS, it's Azure websites, it's uh, functions, uh, and Octopus is this one VM I have to log into and do Windows updates on. Um, so we take care of that for you now with Octopus Cloud. Uh, that's really the main benefit though. We, we back it up, we manage it, we deal with performance, we make sure it's available um, so you don't have to. So I think if your environment is still mostly on premises, you've got uh, a data center, you've got machines in it already, um, adding Octopus to that is just one more VM to look after. Um, it's not a big deal uh, and it's going to be closer to where you're deploying. So I'd put Octopus there. But if everything you're doing is in the cloud, then Octopus Cloud makes a lot of sense. Or, yeah, I, I, we are already um, recommending to our uh, customers who are either implementing Octopus Fresh at the moment, or they've hired us to implement it for them, or they're ready for a, um, maybe they're behind on their versions and they need to, they need to essentially do a migration to a new major version. It's a good opportunity. We're recommending going to the cloud because um, we're, we're pushing their applications into Azure or we are converting uh, either they've already gone to Azure and they have some VMs in Azure and they want to convert it to the PaaS services. Any operating system that you have to manage and patch, um, that's just more surface area um, for risk. And, um, and, th and this is one of those. There's no, uh, there's no downside that we've seen other than network topology. If you really require uh, some you know, special VPN pipes or whatnot, where you just cannot uh, use any of the tentacle um, connectivity methods because of network configuration, that may hold you back. But if if all of your environment is in Azure already, then um, it's more unlikely that you're going to have that issue. So we certainly are 
are recommending to our customers to use the cloud edition. Yeah, and to your point, Anders just asked in the chat, how would Octopus Cloud connect to on-prem stuff? Uh, and that's that's pretty much it. So we have listening tentacles, polling tentacles. They can talk through proxies. We'll go through some of that later, I think. Um, those things all still work because it's still the same Octopus product. The question is, what ports do you want to open? How is how exactly is that is that going to work? These things were all designed to to run over the internet. Like tons of people have had Octopus on-prem, but deploying to machines that might be in AWS EC2 instances or Azure VMs. Um, so doing that in reverse is secure as well. Uh, it just depends on what the network configuration looks like. Uh, and I don't know what you guys were thinking on the pricing thing, but it's really ad ad advantageous to all of you listening to to jump on and get the pricing for Octopus Deploy Cloud now while the getting's good. Because if you have a small team, it's maybe you know, two or three of you, but you have 100 different applications and gobs of servers that you're deploying to, boy, are you going to save a whole lot of money with the Cloud Edition. That's a user-based pricing versus ten uh, tentacle destination pricing. So that's just, that, that's one difference too. So really great for small teams. All right. Um, next question is what are the most common mistakes that we see developers making and how can you avoid them? We talked about this one before the webinar and I think we came up with like, <laughs> we both kind of came up with these big list of things. So I've got my list here. Here, here we go. Um, uh, there's really, there's a couple I'll, I'll call out though. Um, so I think if the first thing we see is you go to someone's deployment process and you watch the page loading and you watch the scroll bar and you realize this process has like a hundred steps in it. And there are some reasons that people that people need that. Sometimes they, they do just have a really large application with a really large deployment process. Sometimes there are other ways to, to approach that. So you can have separate projects that break a lot of these components down. You know, if you've got a hundred steps, but actually like there's five for deploying one component and then the next five deploy the next thing. And then maybe you send some emails out or something. There might be ways that you can break that down into separate projects. And I'll show you later a step that you can use to recombine those things back together. Um, the other, the other reason it happens is it comes back to that thing before about um, those different axes on which you can model your deployments in Octopus, the projects, environments, tenants. Um, you could be using one of those things a little bit differently. Um, and I think the other thing that the other thing we see people doing and perhaps getting wrong is just trying to either being too far on that spectrum of trying to either reuse things or copy and paste things. So you can tie yourself in knots trying to create step templates for everything and then overrides because every project kind of ends up being a little bit different. Likewise, you could just copy and paste things a ton and then suddenly you're having to go and update things in a lot of different places. Trying to find a good middle ground there can be hard, but um, it's something people need to be really conscious of. Yeah, definitely. Uh, another one. Uh, this is a this is a class of mistake that we see all the time, and it's made over and over and over and over again. Um, maybe a, a step in in the library does you know, ninety five percent of what's necessary to deploy a particular application component, or maybe a little PowerShell is needed, or or maybe uh, some some automatic variable replacement wasn't configured just right. And so there's a workaround by writing a little bit of PowerShell. Um, so the next screen is an example of that. Um, this, this little bit of PowerShell is, uh, you know, right there in the Octopus deploy, deployment project. And it essentially upon deploying a website, invoke web request in PowerShell using, uh, using some some variables and some tokenizing and looks for a particular screen to make sure that the web page came up. Um, so um, it's really useful to make sure that the application actually started up. But when you put PowerShell like this, um, I, I would say 99% of the time, when you put inline source code PowerShell into Octopus Deploy, you are going to regret it later down the line. Um, yes, there needs to be some parameters. Yes, there needs to be some variable tokenization and some variability. But um, once you have this working, go ahead and copy and paste that into a PowerShell file and put it with your application in source control and 
check this radio button that says script file inside a package. Go ahead and put that PowerShell in that NuGet package when you bundle it up with that application component because there will be a time when the web sc the screen doesn't say expense report system, you've updated that text. And so that is, this is essentially code that is tied to an implementation detail of your application. It needs to be versioned with the application. And if you change that text, now you go forward and your deployment breaks and then you come in here and you update it and now you go forward. Then the next day or the next week, you've got a bug in production, it's a hot fix, you need to go back in source control and you need to do a quick hot fix. And so you go back in source control, right, try to redeploy again, and this thing fails your deployment because now it's looking for the new text, but your hot fix from your branch and Git back then from last week still says expense report system. So now you've broken your ability to deploy because you have placed um, some, some implementation details in a PowerShell script in here. So this right here is common. It happens, it happens with every one of our customers. And I mean, our customers have done some amazing things, getting some very hairy scenarios to deploy and that's great. And they rejoice and they, and they, uh, sigh a breath of release ah we have it working it's working yes we love octopus deploy our life is so much easier but then they don't spend the time to come back in these places where they've had to write a little bit of powershell and refactor this powershell back into ps1 files put it into their visual studio solution um, so that it, it goes into the NuGet packages and then change this radio button to script file inside a package. You want your Octopus Deploy projects to be a skeleton of the process and the flow, not code, not custom programming like we see on the screen here. So this right here covers just a multitude of common mistakes that we see, um, we, we see customers making. Um, uh, and, and have a few others, Paul, you wanna comment on that by any chance? No, I'll, I'll just echo that. Okay. I think generally, uh, so the, the way I'd like to think about it is ha like, when do things change? So, so in this case, um, you would have to change this script because the application changed. And so it really shouldn't be an octopus, but there's stuff that changes because the way you deploy something has changed. Like the application code is still the same. The way the application is built is still the same, but you've decided to deploy it to a different place or you've changed your deployment architecture. Um, the database, the production database connection string has changed. You know, that stuff shouldn't be versioned. It, it wouldn't make sense to be cutting an old uh, connection string around. Those things belong in Octopus, but uh, this kind of stuff probably doesn't. It's fine. It's, it's a few lines, it's not a big deal, but especially when you find this, these things getting on to like 100, 200 lines of, of PowerShell, they really need to be in source control. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So another common mistake we see is uh, not factoring the deployment projects in the same fashion that their overall software system is factored. So a lot of people are, are, are using microservices or even if you're not using microservices, you've, you've taken your overall system and instead of deploying it all together, maybe you've broken it up into three pieces or to four pieces and, and they go in separate Git repositories and they have separate builds. If you have, uh, if you have more than one thing to deploy, and they might vary on maintenance window if you use those or deployment schedules, then they are separate things to deploy. Now, if you have a website, a scheduled EXE and a SQL Server database that's all has the same version number and it's all deployed at the same time, every time, well then that's one application, okay? And it has three different, three different uh, components and that should be this, in the same deployment project because it's one thing. But if you deploy, a Windows service at a different schedule as a website, then by that decision, regardless of Octopus Deploy or not, you've decided that they have different deployment processes and so they should be in different deployment projects. And so factoring the deployment projects is really important and you've already made those decisions. You don't have to decide how should I, what, what should I put into each deployment project and how many should I have? Just think about if you're manually deploying this, you've already made those architectural decisions. You've already structured the architecture of the system and this, the schedule and the dependencies that each one has for when to deploy. You should just model those decisions that you've already made when you're designing your deployment projects within Octopus Deploy. And the same thing goes for object-oriented development 
you want to encapsulate what belongs with a particular application and use uh, project dependencies and project triggers if you, if you, for instance, need another application to be deployed on a particular environment because you depend on it. You can trigger that deployment from a downstream deployment project. You don't want a certain deployment project to take the responsibility of deploying a different application merely because on your environment you need it to exist. You want to use inter-project uh, dependencies in order to trigger that so that a single deployment project only deploys a single application. All right, any other uh, common mistakes before we move on, Paul? No, that sounds good. All right. So Jeffrey, I want to I want to run full system Selenium tests after my deployment completes. Where should test runs go? And I think we've kind of already addressed this. Yeah, we did because Selenium tests are a specific, so, such a common tool for acceptance tests. Um, those go in your first line automated deployment environment. Um, and, and before we did look at the different types of environments. Um, and, and so besides Selenium tests, these are a class of tests that in order to run, they cannot run on your build server. They do require a deployed application in order to run effectively. Um, Besides Selenium, you could also run the Wave toolbar, you know, ADA accessibility tests uh, for in the US customers. You could run security penetration tests from Tenable.io. You could run abbreviated load tests from VSTS load testing. Uh, there's so many other types of test suites that you may want to run, but those test suites require a completely deployed application in order to function. So all of these types of test suites would execute right after Octopus Deploy is finished deploying to that first line automated, no humans allowed environment type. And you could, you could have those in parallel using tenants if you wanted to, if you had four of those test suites and you wanted to run them all in parallel, or you could run you know, four test suites one after another on the same environment, um, provided you know, that, that you're not sitting there waiting for too long, depending on how long those take to run. So you can factor it at different ways, but that is where those run. And again, the, the continuous delivery pipeline is all about quality. Um, if all you're doing is installing bits on servers and relying on manual testing, uh, Capers Jones and all the, the statistics around the industry show that if you're relying uh, on, on just the manual testing there, you're only gonna achieve about 33% of your defect removal efficiency, which is how many defects you find versus your customer finds. And that's just not gonna be enough. So you really need to jam pack that continuous delivery pipeline with all kinds of, con of, of quality control checks. Um, and, and deploying is just the start and it gives you the capability there. Okay. Hey, Je yeah. Jeffrey, JD just asked, so, uh, so, so the app gets deployed, it's in a, a test environment, but it's perhaps running across a bunch of machines with a database and so on. Where does the test harness run in this case? The, you know, the thing that is executing sure. the test? Sure, the test, the test harness is going to have to run from a build server technology that supports the execution of tests. So in the VSTS instance we gave a few slides ago, um, the release manager capability is going to use the Octopus Deploy extension to signal to Octopus Deploy, hey, do all the heavy lifting and deploy my application in this first line automated test environment. And then Octopus Deploy does all that work. And then once it's done, it's, it, the extension signals back to VSTS, hey, I'm done. Then VSTS, um, just like it would run any other in-unit suite, uh, essentially says, okay, go. And if you have an in-unit test suite, that contains Selenium tests, then um, uh, it, it runs. Now in the installation of the in-unit test suite that contains Selenium tests, Octopus Deploy would have copied that to a target server and poked in the appropriate variables, connection strings, whatever it needs, URLs for that particular environment. So the STS, all it has to do is use the in-unit or in-unit task to, um, to kick off that test suite, the test suite runs and VSTS records all of the results from all of those tests. Um, and so that's how the responsibilities are separated between the two technologies or, or really any, any other 
build technology that can run in unit, X unit tests, et cetera. Okay. All right. So next uh, question we have is, Paul, I have multiple software applications that all version and deploy separately, but to set up an environment, they all have to be deployed. How can I manage releases where the GA release is a tested and verified combination of specific versions of all my applications or microservices? I, I, love, I love microservices, can I just say, because for, when you're in the business of making deployment tools, microservices are great because they shift what used to be like a big collaboration problem, right? You've got this massive app, you know, one big source control um, repository, heaps of developers working on it. Like there's a massive communication overhead that has to happen during development. And the great thing about microservices, they kind of allow all these little teams to kind of work in isolation with just really well-defined contracts between them. And then all the communication problems happen at deployment time because suddenly all these things have to come together with the right versions and the dependencies and, and so on. So it kind of shifts a lot of that communication trouble from being a, a compile time problem, if you like, a, a dev time problem to a, a runtime problem, a deployment problem. Um, but there are some ways to handle it. If you go to the next slide, so this is something that a lot of people might have uh, missed and you alluded to it before with project dependencies. So here we've got um, a project called Voltron and it's made up of a lot of different sub projects. And so, so the ideal scenario here would be you're doing microservices, each of the engineering teams that are responsible for each of these services, uh, each one is represented as a project within Octopus. So, so black line, blue line in this case would be different path, different microservices. So you're building and deploying these things. And quite often you do want to deploy them to like a, a dev environment or a test environment to make sure your component is working, perhaps to run some automated tests against it. But then at some point, you're going to be going in through like a staging and production environment. Now there's a school of thought around microservices, which would be, well, if you have to deploy them all at the same time, you're not really doing microservices. You're doing a distributed monolith, I think would be the terminology. I don't necessarily subscribe to that. I think a lot of people, as they kind of go on their journey towards microservices, that's kind of where they want to end up. All these teams working completely in isolation, deploying at different times and kind of a guarantee that everything will just work. But generally people are coming from a background where, you know, they do, once a month, they do kind of put a bunch of stuff through staging and they get their customers to sign off on it. And there's a long test process before it goes to production. And when you're doing that, you do want to be pretty specific about what version of the app is getting promoted into, into production. And so the way that this works with Octopus is, is we then make this project called Voltron. Um, we call this kind of like the Uber release, but what we have is a deployment process which actually just deploys other projects. And so when you create a release of this Voltron project, when you go to the release creation page, you know, normally we would show like the list of package versions and you'd go and choose which packages make up the app. When you deploy this Voltron one, instead you'll be actually choosing which release of, of the black line project or the blue line project is going to be included in the Voltron project. And when it runs, it'll go and deploy that project, that release of that project to the same environment. What's cool about this is because it's a process, you can put other things in the middle. So you could have a bunch of these that run in parallel. You could, in this case, we have an approval step that happens before, but you could send an email midway through or you get to control the order that they run in. So what's nice about that is you kind of guarantee that, you know, we've got this suite of microservices. We've tested them all in staging. We've tested our deployment process in staging. We're confident it works. Now we're gonna take that whole set of releases and put them into production and follow that same consistent process through it. So um, so look for this within Octopus. It's, I think it's called like the deploy release step. Um, this is a really good way to handle this. And the great thing about it is the Voltron project is nice and simple. It's just deploying a bunch of sub projects. And if you go into each of the sub projects, they're simple too. They, they would only ideally have a five or six steps, not, not kind of this 100 project mega microservice deployment um, project. Yeah, we, we use this quite a bit when there's multiple pieces. It doesn't even matter if you call it microservices or whatnot. If you have multiple pieces that make up the system and they all have to work together in coordination, you have this type of scenario. All right, Paul, another one uh, for you. I thought I, I thought a tenant was a customer, such as in single instance multi-tenant. What's the vision that you guys have behind tenants? Yeah, multi-tenancy is an overloaded term. So, so, so what tends to happen, right, is you have, you, you start a business um, and you have one customer 
And so you build the app and it's, let's say it's got a SQL database and uh, a web app um, and it's running on IS or something. And you build that and you deploy it and it's, it's written for that customer. And then customer number two comes along. Now at this point, you've got a choice. You can change all of the code in that application and make it kind of aware of like, depending on the URL, we're gonna show a different customer here. We're gonna go, perhaps you've got either in the database, you might have a table of these customers or tenants who are signing on for your service. And you're gonna, every query you do is gonna have where customer equals this. And you'll get that from the query string or session or something like that. Um, so that's where your, your application itself is multi-tenant aware. Your application itself knows that there are different customers. Um, the other way you could do it is you just deploy another copy of the app and you go to the web config file and you change the, all the stuff that relates to the customer. You point them at a different connection string. So you're essentially for every customer you're signing on board, you're just deploying a complete copy of the application and the database and everything that goes with it. And there are variations on this, right? It's pretty common to have a database per customer, but then, um, different, uh, like an application service tier that's able to select between them depending on the URL. Alternatively, you go the full the full approach where everyone gets their own IS website and, and so on. And generally it starts off kind of based, partly requirements around like, what do the customers kind of expect around how the data is isolated? How are you scaling it? Like, do you have particular customers who tend to use the service a lot more or, and you kind of want to provide a dedicated service to them? Or do you have thousands and or thousands or millions of customers. So if you're doing, I saw someone in the chat was from uh, Zero, the accounting uh, software company. They have thousands and thousands of customers. Um, they probably aren't gonna deploy like a separate IS website for every customer who signs on. It would just probably be a big waste of resources, I'm guessing. Um, so for this in Octopus, for customers who are deploying a copy of the app, uh, this is where multi-tenancy in Octopus comes in. So here we've got a project, um, we've got dev test production environments, and then we have these tenants. And this is that third dimension I talked about. So in this case, we've got uh, for dev deployments, we don't deploy to a particular tenant. We just have a dev environment that has a web server and we deploy to it. Um, when it comes to testing, we also have a test environment that we use internally for the team. But then BMW have asked us, in BMW being a customer in this in this example, they've asked for their own dedicated test environment that they want to go and approve before things go to production. And then you can see there's actually no production environment for the company. It doesn't really make sense. Every customer has their own production environment. And when you deploy, you can deploy, you can tag these customers. You can have variables that are scoped depending on those tags. So you can say all customers who have signed up for the billing module, um, that can be a tag that you apply to those particular customers. And then you can have variables or deployment steps that apply based on that. So if you've got like a, a nice plugin architecture where um, these modules, like customers can choose from which modules are available during the billing process uh, or based on their tier or something like that. Um, and you've got different DLLs that kind of plug in at deployment time. You can have different steps that run that, that put those things in. It's really, really powerful. And it, it's, a much better approach than just copying and pasting the projects each time you sign a customer up. You can use the API for tenants. So you can have like your app, when someone signs up, you can call the Octopus API and say, hey, create a tenant for it, deploy to it. We actually use this for Octopus Cloud. So if you sign up for Octopus Cloud through the website, it calls into an Octopus server that we have, which creates a tenant that represents you and then deploys your Octopus Cloud instance. All So it's like Octopus deploying Octopus. So this is the, the vision behind tenants, right? Where for people who have customers, lots of different customers, more than one production environment where the, the production environments are owned by the customers. Each tenant has their own variables too, which is really cool. But people can use this in other ways. So, um, so we've seen people have, uh, they've used multi-tenancy in Octopus, but to actually represent the developers. So imagine that you are doing microservices, um, but you've, what you tend to find with microservices is in, in dev time, you ideally just want to work on like your service and nothing else. But sometimes you do need to kind of deploy everything else locally just to kind of make sure that it works. Or you've got, let's say for every developer, their own little Azure sandbox that they're deploying um, a copy of the app into so they can test changes they're making to their thing. You can use tenants to model that so that each tenant would be an individual contributor on your team. Um, 
Feature branches are another way that people use it. So they'll create a tenant per feature branch. And then essentially there's different copies of each environment for those, um, for those tenants. We'd like to find better ways to model these things in Octopus in future, because it's not really what it was designed for, but it actually works really well as a, as a workaround. Hopefully that gives people an idea of how to use tenancy in Octopus. Yeah, and the anti-pattern that you can pick out that you're not using tenants well is if you have an environment called BMW production, an environment called Coca-Cola production, and then you end up having scroll to the right and you have a checkerboard dashboard, that's when you're not using tentacles. If you look at it and you see that, right away, rethink how, how you are, or maybe you haven't implemented and you should. Yep. All right. So Jeffrey, what's the best way to handle tons and tons of variables? And we see this all the time. Variables was something we again assumed people would have like 30, 40, 50. We've seen customers that have like 100 mega variables um, that they're trying to scroll through. And uh, anyway, I'm rambling now. Um, uh, casing conventions, what are some good practices around variables? Sure. Well, the first thing, let me tackle the uh, naming conventions first and just talk about what's kind of standard in the tool. Just like, just like in, in .NET for namespaces and classes, uh, basically the .NET framework has given us a naming convention for namespaces and classes. It's basically Pascal, Pascal casing. Um, and there's, uh, you know, fields and, and private variables the framework that you're using has already set a standard for naming conventions and how to organize it. Same with Octopus Deploy. Look at all of the built-in Octopus Deploy variables and see how they are grouped by environment and release. And they use, they use dot notation to separate a type of namespacing and they're Pascal cased. That is essentially the naming convention of Octopus Deploy. And so use that, use that and it'll be so easy to, um, uh, read and categorize the variables that you choose for your deployment projects, your variable sets, your tenants, everything, and create your own taxonomy of top level categories. And just look at the way that Octopus Deploy has implemented its own variables, because there are tons and tons of variables within the Octopus Deploy tool itself. And so, so learn from how that has been organized in, how, in your own implementation. Okay, so that's the namespacing and that's the casing conventions part of this. Now, uh, let's talk about when to use a variable and when not to and when to be explicit and when to be, um, when to be automated. So if a value for a particular app setting varies by environment or varies by machine or varies by customer, then, um, then definitely use one of the uh, one of the variable mechanisms. If it does need to be in app config or web.config, if it does need to be there, but it doesn't vary here and it just stays there, then put that value in source control unless it's sensitive and a credential, okay? If it's just, uh, if it's just how it needs to go, put it, put it in source control. Uh, if it can be, be elevated to source control, You've probably heard the term shift left on a quality control perspective. Uh, variables are, uh, can think of them as implementation details. And if you can shift left a value and promote it to source control, then go for it. Now, if it does need to vary, then you put the base value for the local development environment in source control. Again, we're talking about non-sensitive, non-credentials. And then poke it in by environment, uh, use, use tokenizing sparingly when nothing else will work. And, and then when, when going through your sea of variables and it has to change by environment, it has environment by machine, by customer, when you add a new customer with the tenant feature, you, what you don't want to do is go into your tenant variables and say, okay, now this value is going to be BMW web server, and this value is going to be Coca-Cola web server, and this value is going to be yada, yada. What you want to do is essentially automate the creation of values by tokenizing the variables themselves. This is the magic that you come into with managing all of these variables. If, even though your application may need tons and tons of variables, if you can create a structure where your environment, your machine, your tenant, your customer, your release number, essentially you use tokens to form higher level variables 
so that the number of explicitly set variables is very, very small. That's what you want to do. You want to dynamically create as many variable values as possible by using the tenant name, which is going to be the customer, uh, to form perhaps a, uh, another value and, and write to logs and, th and things like that. Um, you don't want to have to maybe add a machine and then every, oh, here's a symptom of an anti-pattern. If you add a machine to the environment and then you have to go into multiple variables and add the name of the machine into multiple different settings and duplicate variables for that machine. If instead you just push the machine name as a dynamic token within the value of something that needs the machine name, then yes, you have a lot of variables, but 99% of them are automatically created for you by other variables in the system. And then machines can come online, um, customers can come online, new releases, new application components can come online without manually modifying the number or the values of variables. This is another thing where, if you're in a situation where you have to go in all the time on a daily or weekly basis and constantly change values and type in values into variables, you are creating implementation details in your deployment project configuration as, as a whole, and it is going to hamper your ability to hot fix, hot fix production by going back in time two weeks and, and automatically deploying because if you make application changes or environment changes or environment topology changes, and that requires you to change variable values, then implementation details are seeping into your configuration. So you want to create as many of those variables dynamically as possible. You want to add anything to that, Paul? No, I think that's great advice. All right. So, Paul, next, uh, and we just have a, a few left. So, I appreciate uh, the attendees hanging with us as we go over time a little bit. Paul, how can I store my entire Octopus configuration in Git so that when I change it, hotfix it, uh, branch branch from weeks ago, it can still be deployed? Yeah. So, we don't have a great story for this at the moment. And if you use Octopus, obviously, you probably found that. Ideally, we'd have some kind of way that kind of automatically syncs everything you do in Octopus into Git. Um, it's not quite clear that the best way that we'd go about it because there's so many different things in Octopus and some of them don't really make sense to put in Git. How do we store sensitive variables, all that kind of stuff. Um, there are a few proposals around and I'll paste some links into the chat after this. I'd love some comments on people as to kind of what approach they think we should take. That said, a lot of these problems can still be handled in Octopus. So you may or may not be aware that when we create a release in Octopus, we snapshot the deployment process and the variable set. So if you've created a release last week and you've then changed your deployment process, maybe you've switched from VMs to Azure websites or something like that, you can still go back to that old release and um, redeploy it and it'll still use that snapshot of the variables and the, and the release. You can update the variables if you need to. But that, that kind of gives you some ability to go back in time and, and kind of roll back. So we're creating those snapshots every time you create a release. We've also got the, obviously the audit history. There's a tool if you run up Octopus Manager, which is the, it's like a rich application for, that's installed when you install the Octopus server. Um, there's a tool in there that allows you to export everything to JSON and import everything from JSON. There's obviously an API that you can call to back up a lot of these things or use the API to recreate projects and put the code that does that in, in source control. There's client libraries and so on to deal with it. So there's a lot of different ways you can put the stuff you're doing in Git. Um, there are ways to deploy PowerShell scripts that live inside Git repositories now. I'll link to that as well. Um, but yeah, this is a not a, there's not a great solution for this yet. Yeah, and, the, and the, what we're doing with our customers is um, limiting the things that are tied to how the application is developed or what might change because of a feature because um, there's just things that are that uh, um, are not possible to source control right now. And, and, you know, this isn't unique to Octopus Deploy. I think all of the, or most of the, build server technologies have the same same dynamic where if you accidentally put something in the build uh, or deployment configuration 
and your application changes and necessitates that to change, you've kind of broke your production hotfix capability. You're, you're going backwards in time capability. All right, Paul, another one for you. My data center is locked down and we are not going to Azure anytime soon. How can I use Octopus Deploy? Um, there's a different production network separate from the one that I can access. Mm. So these types of things we generally uh, help customers with in support and we can kind of help to draw an architecture diagram of how they could approach it. But there's some some different terms in Octopus that are probably good for people to be aware of. So let's talk a little bit about Octopus architecture. Um, if you go to the next slide, actually, there's, so there's the Octopus server, and this is a, a Windows service that's running. It's got the web front end that they're used to seeing. It's the thing you see when you use Octopus. And it's also the thing that orchestrates deployments. So when you deploy something and you've got that set of steps to run through, that's the Octopus server doing that. Octopus server can be configured to be highly available. You can have multiple nodes running, typically two to four. Um, but that's the Octopus server side. And then we've got a thing called Tentacle. Tentacle is also a Windows service, but it's an agent. And it's, it's actually quite um, dumb. It does a couple of things. It transfers files and it runs scripts. So it's pretty much the equivalent of, if in the Linux world, an SSH um, server that you're connecting into and transferring files to and running scripts. Um, so that's Tentacle. Tentacle runs a thing called Calamari. Calamari, because some people asked about it in chat, Calamari is just a um, an executable that's able to do a lot of those conventions around deploying. And it's actually open source. If you go to our GitHub uh, repository, you'll find Calamari there. If you've ever wondered, you know, when we're doing an IS deployment or an Azure website deployment, what exactly are we doing? That's all, all that logic lives in Calamari. So when Octopus deploys something, it takes Calamari, which is this executable, and it sends it over to Tentacle, unless it's already there, and it sends the package over that it needs to deploy, and then it tells Tentacle, hey, go and run that. When you set up Tentacle, so Tentacle is a, it's, like I said, it's a, a thing that runs scripts and transfers files. It listens on a, a port or it can use polling mode with Octopus. So, um, so there are these two different modes, listening mode and polling mode, and you choose them essentially based on where you want to make the firewall changes. So you either have uh, the Tentacle, the remote machine listening and Octopus is connecting into it, or you have the tentacle polling octopus and saying, hey, do you have anything for me to do? Do you have anything for me to do? And you open up the firewall port on the octopus server. So when you've got these, um, these environments where things are running on-prem, but perhaps octopus is in a different network subnet or so on, you can choose between polling and listening tentacles as your way of kind of working around those things. If you go to the next slide, you can then add proxy servers into this. So it's a specific type of proxy server. Um, it's got to be a proxy server that kind of transparently forwards HTTPS connections because that's what Octopus and Tentacle are using. Um, but there's a lot of different proxy servers available. If you've already got a proxy, chances are it may work with Octopus. What you can do with this is this can essentially create a jump box, if you like. So if you've got a bunch of tentacles on a subnet that the Octopus server can't directly see, there may be a proxy server that that you can get to. Now, some people say like, we've got this totally isolated production environment that's separate to the dev environment. They say, well, you must manage it somehow. Like, how do you manage it? Oh yeah, there's a jump box. We remote desktop to that. And then from there, we, we remote desktop to other things. Well, you can put that proxy server there um, or you could put a tentacle there or you could perhaps even consider putting Octopus there. For a lot of customers where PCR compliance, for example, is an issue, they'll have, um, they'll have Octopus kind of in the same level as say Active Directory or something where it's just kind of the same service and it's treated like a production service. So, um, so it's, it kind of falls within the PCI compliance scope and Octopus passes those audits. For some people, they, and, but because of that, it's also deploying into the dev and test environments. But that works and a lot of PCI compliance auditors kind of don't have a problem with it once you explain what Octopus does and how it works. That said, some people prefer to just have dev and test in their own kind of network subnet and, and production in a completely separate world with its own octopus. So you have an octopus in dev and test and then you have another octopus in production just because it kind of allows all the dev test stuff to completely fall outside of PCI compliance auditing scope and simplifies the paperwork. Um, 
when you do that, you've got this problem of how do you get your deployment process and everything in sync between the dev and test servers and the production servers. There's a lot of different ways you can do that. Again, we have an API that a lot of people uh, call into to sync those things. Octo.exe, our command line tool, has a way of exporting projects and releases from one project and transferring them to another. What we tend to find is that everyone has slightly different requirements around this, so there's no real generic approach, but, but it can be done. Uh, the next slide, there's a third way of doing this though, which is called offline drops. So this is an alternative to tentacle where, so you would use, let's say in the dev and test environments, you would use tentacle to deploy things to remote machines. But then um, when it comes time to go to production, you can use an offline drop. And what this will actually do is it'll create a zip file uh, or a folder structure that has everything needed to deploy the app. And then you take that and figure out a way to get it to production. So that might be putting on a USB drive or you know, FedExing it to somebody. Um, it could be some other out of band way of syncing it. And then you run it locally on the machines. That tends to work well when you've got a handful of machines, not sort of dozens or hundreds of them and not a big orchestrated deployment process. Um, but where you don't have easy access to production where the people involved want a lot more control over when deployments happen or perhaps when it's a customer that you're deploying to. Um, so you're a web agency building stuff locally, but the end customer is completely somewhere else and they don't want to give you access. So there's a lot of different options around how you can do Octopus networking to, to kind of use one Octopus server to deploy everything. There's a few options around how you can use separate Octopus servers to work together to deploy stuff. And then there's ways where you can use thumb drives and offline stuff um, as well. Hopefully that helps people. But again, complex scenarios like this, good to talk to either clear measure or get in touch with our support. We'd be happy to help you find a, a way that works. Yeah, plenty of options. We've never hit a brick wall. Um, and even whether it's on premise or, um, or uh, and we, we advise uh, people to put production in a separate Azure subscription with a different, you know, which is by nature a different security boundary than dev test because you don't want, it, it's unnecessary surface area to have every developer have access to the production Azure subscription or the production data center. Um, and maybe for a time somebody needs access to set up the automated process, but once the automated process is, is done, that access can be taken away. And yeah, for, for auditability, uh, um, uh, needs that looks really good and it, and it is really good to have a production environment where almost nobody has access because only the automation deploys things that have been done the same way in a proven process multiple times in pre-production so never hit a brick wall uh, with the uh, with the capabilities but we have run over time um, uh, we're, we're a little bit 20 minutes over time. We have more questions that have been posted in the Slack channel and in chat, and we commit, we will answer every question, whether in, in Slack or by, by blog post. Um, and uh, appreciate all of the participation in, in posting these questions ahead of time, as well as, as well as inline. Um, I, I really enjoyed this and, and great back channel communication in Slack. Uh, Paul, you look like you enjoyed it too. I have, I have. It's um six. It was six thirty in the morning when we started this for me, but uh, it woke me up. It's been, it's been great. And thanks everybody for for participating in chat. It's made it a much more community uh, feel to it. So thank you. Yeah, definitely. It's the the end end of the day here for us uh, in in Austin, Texas. So we're kind of on the two ends of the spectrum here, and I think we have uh, attendees from all over the world. Um, we have a massive audience here, so this has been great. Um, and a small percentage participated in Slack, but we thank you for doing that. You shoot 53 people in Slack. So fantastic. Um, in, in closing, um, there's a URL on the screen, clear-measure.com slash octopus. Um, that'll be uh, your ticket to a free offer. Again, make sure that we have your name and contact information if you'd like that uh, free laminated poster of, of uh, the end-to-end -end octopus deploy uh, recommended implementation and how it fits together with, uh, with, with build servers. And um, we also have a free offer for all webinar attendees. Um, your, your team, you personally, your team, your company, um, if you want a free DevOps pipeline design for your particular application, 
a free pipeline design using Octopus Deploy for your application. Just reach out and we're happy to do it. Um, and it's a pretty quick process too. So um, reach out and that's, that's the free offer. Just use the URL on the screen and as well as any follow-up questions. And um, thank you very much for, for giving us your time, which is very valuable. And any other words in closing, Paul? No, that sounds great. Thank you, everybody. Um, do reach out. Jeffrey, as you've probably seen from this webinar, is a super smart guy. The whole team at Clear Measure have uh, been really impressive to work with lately. Um, if you've got any questions around how to do CICD stuff, definitely talk to them. All right. Well, have a great day, everyone. Thank you.